Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. And I really love talking about this stuff. And my family's kind of sick of hearing it. So thank you for letting me have this opportunity. Uh, we're gonna talk tonight about the Andersonville Raiders. And for those of you who don't know, Andersonville was the worst prison in the South. Um, it had, more, it didn't have enough resources. It didn't have medicine. It didn't have shelters. It um, was severely overcrowded. It had at its peak 33,000 men in a 26 acre stockade fence. The water supply was polluted because they had to use the same little stream for their washing, their drinking, and their toilet. Um, of the 33,000 men that were there, um, just under 13,000 are still there. Um, they died mostly of diarrhea, dysentery, and scurvy. In the middle of all this, you had a group of prisoners that started preying on the other prisoners. They would rob them, they would take what they had, anything of value. And the rumor was that they um, even committed murder, in the course of committing their crimes. Um, there was a group of prisoners, the story goes, and this is the most common version. A group of prisoners got together, they formed a group called the Regulators, and the Regulators took down the Raiders. Um, they had a trial, they convicted six of them who they say were the leaders, and um, they actually executed them right there in the prison. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight is the Raiders, who were these guys and how did they end up in such a, a way? Now, the way I got into this is when I got certified as a high school history teacher, a friend of mine said, I have all these letters that belong to a Civil War sailor. He wasn't an ancestor of hers, but her grandmother had been his widow's nurse. And when the widow died, there were no children that survived. And the nurse didn't want to just toss out the letters. So she took them and she brought them home. And they were the most unbelievable letters I had ever seen. He was a sailor on the Housatonic, which some of you might recognize the name. It was the first ship ever sank, sunk by an enemy submarine. The guys in the submarine didn't survive. Um, he talked about chasing blockade runners. He talked about having black fug fugitive slaves coming up to the Housatonic and trying to get their freedom that way and being put to work mm -hmm. as contraband so that they didn't have to be returned on the fugitive slave law. He has a six page description on one of the letters of a battle that he's watching from the deck of the Housatonic. And he's writing the letter as the battle is happening. And if you check the date that the letter is written and the location of the Housatonic, he is watching the Battle of Fort Wagner. And if you ever saw the movie Glory, this is the battle at the end of the movie. This guy is writing the letter while it's happening, describing it. He thought they had actually taken the fort. He said, they're up over the wall, we got it now. And then the next morning he had to say, I'm sorry, but I was mistaken. Uh, once I had the letters, I did what everybody did. I Googled it, and it turned out that this guy's diary belonged to a priest in New York State, uh, Father Jefferson Hammer. He had walked into an antique store, found a little leather-bound book, started flipping through it, and realized it was the diary of a prisoner of war. Uh, same guy. And this is the page in the diary that describes the raiders. Um, it starts, I'm going to start just above that page break, about three lines up. Six of the raiders who have been on trial for their lives by a jury of our own men were hung at 5 p.m. today. Their names were, and then he leaves a blank. Now, when I was reading this, I was curious. So I thought, okay, it'll be easy to just go look up what the six names were, fill in the blank mentally and move on. Except that it turned out that there were six names, no, seven, seven names for the six raiders. And at that point I was off. Okay, these are the graves as they look today. That opening picture was a shot of the graves in 1865. Uh, from left to right, it says Patrick Delaney from Pennsylvania, Charles Curtis of Rhode Island, William Collins of Pennsylvania, John Sarsfield of, Pen of New York, William Rickson, United States Navy, and A. Munn, United States Navy. Uh, there is a seventh name that's often mentioned that was mentioned, uh, John Sullivan, and I will get to him in a while. But I'm gonna tell you right now that of those six grave markers, four of the names on them are wrong. But first, a word about my sources. Um, the most famous account of the Raiders is written by a guy named John McElroy, who wrote a best-selling book in 1879. And he said that 
he and his buddies from the 16th Illinois Cavalry got together under the leadership of a guy named Leroy Key, and they took down the Raiders without any assistance from the Confederates whatsoever. Um, at one point, he says during the hanging, one of the Raiders suddenly realizes he's about to be executed and he runs. Um, according to McElroy, Henry Wirtz, who was the commandant of the prison, was up in the star fort. He saw the guy run. He heard all the tumult. He was afraid the prisoners were going to rush the gate and escape. And according to McElroy, McElroy could hear Wirtz running down the from the headquarters, screaming for the head of the artillery to open his cannons on the prisoners. And it's a really exciting story, but I'm going to show you why I don't think it ever happened. This is a view of Andersonville looking from the Star Fort. Um, that big green open field, that's where the prison was. If you look off to the right, you can see the recreated North Gate. And just to put it in perspective, uh, the part that's above ground, the logs are 15 feet tall. If you go down the hill a little bit, about four o'clock, there's the pavilion that um, is over Providence Spring. The prisoners were praying for a source of clean water. And the story goes that there was a lightning strike and water came bubbling up. And to this day, the water actually still does bubble up. I've, I'm told that no matter how bad the drought gets, it keeps bubbling. Okay, so that's pretty big. Um, just to the left of that phone pole is a stone pillar that, it's one of the two that marks the South Gate. I'm five foot tall, it's taller than I am. So you're looking really far away. The gallows is you go in through the south gate and it's a couple yards in. It's probably behind the phone pole in this picture, but it's also probably about a quarter mile away from the star fort. And I stood there and I went, okay, it's a quarter mile away. There's a 15 foot tall fence between him and it. When the prisoner takes off, all the other prisoners start screaming. So they're making a lot of noise. And McElroy says he didn't say anything because he didn't think the guy next to him could hear. And yet he says he's able to pick out the voice of Henry Wirtz screaming for the artillery to open fire on the prisoner. He says the only reason they didn't do it was the guy in charge of the artillery was not so panicky as Captain Wirtz was. But um, I looked at this and went, there's no way that happened. If you were in those circumstances, you could not pick out one voice a quarter mile away, over 26,000 other screaming voices with a 50, two 15 foot stockade fences between you. So at that point, I started to question McElroy, and I found he was really easy to discredit. He writes his book 15 years after the prison closes, but he says he remembers all of this dialogue and the names and the regiments of everybody. Um, he says that his regulators acted without any rebel assistance. In fact, they could not have done it without the, the Confederates and the support of Henry Wartz. Um, there are two general orders that are issued for um, Concerning the Raiders, General Order 57 authorizes the trial. General Order 61 authorizes the execution. Um, Henry Wirt sends his guards in to help arrest the Raiders. He holds them he holds them outside the stockade. He helps in the choice of the jurors because uh, they do want them to be sergeants, which are usually the highest ranking guys in the prison. And he, they do want them to be the most recently arrived because they figure those are the less likely ones to be pressed. Pre yeah, prejudiced. So Wirtz absolutely has something to do with it, even though he, McElroy insists that he didn't. Um, McElroy says there was this great battle royal between the Raiders and the Regulators. They all stood in two lines and they faced off and it was a desperate struggle, except not a single prisoner wrote about it or mentioned it, even though McElroy says everybody was standing on the hill watching. So that didn't hold up. When they bring the raiders into the stockade to hand them over for execution, Henry Wirtz goes in on his horse with the guards and the priest. And, um, he hands them over and all accounts say that he made a little speech. Um, I, it goes something to the effect of, here are the prisoners. Um, I give them to you in as good shape as I got them. Um, do with them as you will. May God have mercy on you and on them. And he turns and he walks out. McElroy inserts a sentence in this speech where Wirt says, I've had nothing to do with it. Here are the prisoners, uh, do with them what you will. I've had nothing to do with it. He never said that. 15 years worth of diaries and memoirs up and before McElroy, not a single person says he said that. Uh, we just talked about him 
inventing the story that Wurtz is telling the artillery to fire on the prisoners. Um, there's a story that McElroy tells where um, Curtis and a group of raiders, Curtis, one of the raiders, Curtis and a group of raiders go after Leroy Key, who's organizing the, the regulators. And Key bluffs him off, bluffs them off with a fake gun because they were going to kill him. If you read Leroy Key's interview that he gave with the Boston newspaper in 1864, that's not what happened. Key says he was approached by Curtis and some of the other raiders, and they asked him if he was intending to clear out the Irish. Key assures them they're not. They shake hands and they go their separate ways. So clearly, one of them is not telling the truth on that one. Um, McElroy always exaggerates everything. He says that there were 500 raiders and up to three murders a night with heads bashed in, skulls bashed in, throats slit at the gate in the morning, and not a single cause of death between the time the prison opens and the time the raiders is, are arrested shows anything like that. Everybody died of scurvy, diarrhea, and dysentery for the most part. Um, he has this really dramatic story after the hanging where two of the raiders um, go up to Patrick Delaney, who's just been hanged, and they wipe the froth from his dead lips and they swear vengeance at the foot of the gallows. Um, there is reason to believe that Alan was wearing a ball and chain, and I can't find any proof that Donnelly ever actually existed other than McElroy. And the other thing is, if you were, if you were in a stockade, you're surrounded by 26,000 angry people, you just saw them hang your buddies. One of the guys ran off, they dragged him back and hung him. Um, the priest tried to intervene and get them to let them go, and they shouted the priest down. And and you're gonna openly swear vengeance in those circumstances, Gallows is still right there. They probably would have strung them up. So I don't think they would have really been that stupid as to have done that. The other guy who's really um, quoted a lot is a guy named John Ransom, and he's also not terribly trustworthy. He says he, it's published as the diary of John Ransom, but when they asked him to produce the diary, he said it was burned in a fire, but only after he copied it. So that's a little sketchy. He has the date the hanging takes place wrong. He says that two of the raiders are named Rickson and Munn. There was nobody in the Union Navy named Rickson or Munn, in spite of what you see on that, those last two grave markers. And that's part of, partly why they're wrong. Uh, he says the hangings happened at 11 a.m. They happened about 5 p.m. This is my favorite. Uh, Sarsfield, one of the guys who's hanged, he says he studied law. He fought for three years. He was wounded in action. And he was promoted to lieutenant before his capture. In fact, Sarsfield was a shoemaker who'd been with the New York 40, 140th for seven months before he was captured. There's no record he was ever wounded and he was a private when he was executed. There's no record of him ever having been promoted to lieutenant. So he kind of made all that up. Um, he says that Curtis tells him to hurry, hurry the execution along. Curtis is the guy that when they get to the foot of the, the gallows, he suddenly realizes what's gonna happen and he tries to run. And when you try and try to run and you're surrounded by 26,000 guys who are there to watch you hang, there's nowhere to go. According to John Ransom, Curtis tells him to hurry up. I don't think that happened. And he says that Munn, who is one of the two sailors, claimed to be a poor Irish lad. In fact, he was 22 years old and he was a seaman. So he'd been at sea at least three years before he was before he joined the Navy and another year after that, his year of enlistment was actually up when he was captured. So it didn't seem likely that he would say he was a poor Irish lad. So when I went to write this, I decided I wasn't gonna look at any of the memoirs that were written after McElroy. And as much as I could, I held on to that. There's one exception. I was gonna look at prisoners' diaries, memoirs written before 1870. I was gonna look at regimental history, compiled military service records, and the transcript of the Raiders that was published in the 1865 Sunday Mercury. And there's a little um, segment of the article that I'm talking about there. Um, the, let's see, the very last uh, headline down there says, detailed statement of the whole event, uh, sorry, of the whole proceeding by the official reporter of the court. So, for a long time, when I started this, they said there was no transcript. The prisoners wrote that it had been there had been one taken, but some people said it was sent to Washington. Some said it was Richmond, and nobody seemed to know where it was. Um, I think I know where it is. Well, sort of. So how do we know it's authentic? 
Okay, the guy that writes as the court reporter is a guy named Edward Wellington Boat. He's an Irish guy. Um, he is a newspaper reporter, surprisingly enough for the Sunday Mercury. Um, a month after the executions take place, he's part of a delegation of six prisoners that Henry Wirt sends to Washington, DC to see Abraham Lincoln, to give him a petition to ask him to reopen the prisoner exchanges because the cessation of the prisoner exchanges by the union is what caused the really dreadful overcrowding in Andersonville. It was designed for 10,000 people. It ended up with 33,000 at the most, uh, 45,000 altogether. Okay, Boat was a POW and he was at Andersonville. Um, it, he did not blame Henry Wirtz for the conditions at Andersonville. He was kind of unusual. He blamed the federal government, especially Abraham Lincoln who declined to meet with them when they brought the petition. And the beginning of the Mercury article, it says, don't rush to judge Henry Wirtz, listen to what happened. Um, the names of the people he mentions, court officials, lawyers, the accused, the victims, for the most part, I can, I, I can verify that they were all actually at Andersonville. There are one or two exceptions and one or two names that are a little off, but uh, that, that level of accuracy couldn't have come out of nowhere. Um, the convictions in the day that he says that they happened on are corroborated by diaries. The first day, uh, one of the raiders was convicted. There are diaries that say one of the raiders was convicted and the next day, three guys in these diaries that confirm that. Um, there are details in the article, in the article, in the testimony that can be confirmed by other prisoners' diaries. And the one that kind of really makes you stop is when Sarsfield is robbing a prisoner named Dowd, he threatens to cut out dark Dowd's heart and shove it down his throat. Uh, this is confirmed by the diary of a prisoner named Eugene Forbes. Um, that's pretty explicit. Uh, the article says that more than one of the raiders is using a, an alias, which is kind of surprising. That got me really excited, but we'll get to that later. Um, there's an account of an attack on a guy from the 16th Illinois Cavalry named James Marion Friend, and it the testimony pretty, is pretty close to what McElroy says happened, except that he puts a spin on it. Um, there was a fight and friend's face got slashed with a, a razor. Um, according to McElroy, they were trying to slash his throat. So yeah, close. Um, and he correctly identifies Dowd, the prisoner that got beaten so badly that it made, every, it made the Confederates authorize the arrest and the trial and the executions. And there was a prisoner named John Urban who said that he was Dowd, and I think he actually believed he was. I think he was probably attacked by the Raiders on the same day Dowd was. But if you read his account of what happened and the, the, the history, they don't match. Dowd, never, Dowd supposedly goes to Henry Wirtz, and Henry Wirtz takes one look at him and says, I want the guys that did this. Urban says he never saw Henry Wirtz. Uh, Dowd was supposedly robbed of a pretty good quantity of money. Urban says, I didn't have any money. And Urban never says specifically, I was Dowd. He said, I was the man who's beating uh, Robert Kellogg wrote about. So, so as far as I can tell, yeah, this is the real deal. And it is the trial transcript. There is a copy of it in the National Archives. Um, I, I wasn't the one that found it. So an archivist named Mike Musek, who's retired now, found it. But I'd like to think I would have because every one of the soldier raiders compiled military service records said C, and then it was a number with a bookmark. The number of the bookmark is a clipping of this article. All right, so now that we have all this information, what, what can I tell you about the raiders? Uh, the first one is Patrick Delaney. He's drafted and he enrolls on, Feb on September 10th, 1863. He serves with the 83rd Pennsylvania, which was a tough regiment, let me tell you. Uh, he's about 23 years old, born in 1841. He's an Irish immigrant. Most of the Raiders, I believe, were Irish immigrants. Uh, five of the six were Catholic. The six Collins was born in England, so I think he was the one exception. Um, he does not stay with the army very long. He deserts after about a month. He and a bunch of guys are marching on the double quick. And um, while they're marching, they fall out to catch their breath and they never bother to catch up again. Uh, the whole group is arrested. They're sent to Belle Isle, end of October, beginning of November. The documents are a little contradictory. 
He gets to Andersonville on March 21st, 1864. He's 5'7", brown hair and brown eyes. Uh, even though he is a deserter, he is not a bounty jumper. And usually when I talk to people who know about the Raiders, they say, oh, they were all bounty jumpers and deserters. Actually, no. Um, only one of them was actually a bounty jumper. And I know that because most of these guys either enlisted really early and stayed enlisted, or they were drafted. And if, you're, if you're drafted, there's not a bounty. So deserter, yes. Bounty jumper, no. Uh, here is a passage from the regimental history. And Amos Judson is actually the captain of Patrick Delaney's company. And he's talking about this group of soldiers who were committing crimes on the ship on their way down to join the regiment. Um, and it goes, the majority of them were the grandest scoundrels, scoundrels that ever went on home. These were the cream and flour, the very head and front of New York rioters, gamblers, thieves, pickpockets, and blacklegs, many of whom, it is said, had fled to escape punishment for crimes of arson, robbery, and homicide. On board the boats that took them to Alexandria, they fought, gambled, and stole from each other. Some of them stole several hundred dollars at a time, and in justice to the plundered parties, the officers in charge had to tie their arms behind them and almost swing them from the yard arms for hours before they would disgorge the stolen money. They fought, gambled, and stole after they got to the regiment. The once peaceful 83rd became uproarious at times with their midnight broils and battles. They were always spoiling for a fight except when in the presence of the enemy. One would have supposed that when men would wake up at midnight and fall to pummeling each other in bed, as they often did, they would have been transported at the prospect of battle, which was, but at such times, it was at such times that they skulked and seized the opportunity to desert. They would get each other drunk and pick each other's pockets while asleep. They would decoy each other out of camp after dark on the pretense of going out to take something good to drink and knock their deluded victims down and rob them of money. In short, these men would have disgraced the regiment beyond all recovery if they had remained, if they had remained three months in it. But thanks to a kind providence or some other invisible power of redemption, they kept deserting a dozen at a time until they were nearly all gone. In a few weeks, the morals of the 83rd began to recover from the shock and return to the formal, normal and healthy condition. So in Patrick Delaney's case, you, th all of these things that he's describing, the luring people out and the grabbing their stuff while they're asleep, um, these are all tactics that the Raiders would use at Andersonville. And when I first started this, I used to wonder if I was at Andersonville, would I steal from the other, my fellow prisoners to survive? These guys are not stealing to survive. These guys have been thieves since before they ever got to Andersonville. Um, so, yeah. And just because I like geography, I used to teach geography, uh, up in the upper right corner, you can see roughly where Delaney is captured. Okay, the next prisoner is Charles Curtis. Curtis is the one that takes off at the last minute and tries to run away, but they drag him back and hang. Uh, not a very pleasant ending. And this is where history is really gonna go off the rails. So here we go. Uh, Charles F. Curtis was a private with the Fifth Rhode Island Heavy Artillery Company A. He's a substitute, so he is not a bounty jumper. Um, and we'll get to the deserter part in a minute. He's 22 years old, supposedly born in Canada. He served for 17 months before he deserts. And everybody always talks about there were bounty jumpers and deserters. If you average together the amount of time that these guys served before they were captured, they served for an, act, an average of 12 and a half months. So they aren't all you know, bounty jumpers and deserters. They stayed quite a while, most of them. Uh, it just happens that Delaney and Sullivan are the two that really go fast. Um, okay, he is hanged on July 11th, 1864. He's the one that tries to take off at the last minute, and save himself, but he can't. And according to his compiled military service record, he deserts on January 1st, 1865. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Ms. Morgan, you made a typo. Uh, he can't be hanged, he can't desert in 1865, he's hanged in 1864. Well, you're right but that's what his compiled military service record listed. Here's something else kind of weird. This is a picture of the Rhode Island Monument at Andersonville. 
Uh, up the top, it says our, let's see, our honored dead. Down the bottom, next to last name is Charles A. Curtis, 5th Rhode Island Heavy Artillery. Now, this is really surprising because the Raiders were held in such disdain by the prisoners that they wouldn't even let them be buried in the same area. Um, the Raiders' graves out in the cemetery are off to the side. I don't know if you noticed that when we looked, there weren't any graves that you could see around them. Um, in fact, to this day, for Memorial Day, when all the graves of the soldiers at Andersonville get flags, those six do not get flags. And at Christmas time, there's a group called Wreaths Across America that tries to get a, a wreath on the grave of every soldier that's in the national cemeteries. Um, these six do not get wreaths at Christmas. Okay, that was sort of surprising, but I can tell you that this monument was made mostly by politicians. At the dedication, there were only three soldiers present. And of those three soldiers, two of them were guys from Rhode Island, Rhode Island but they'd surf in Massachusetts. So um, there wasn't really anybody involved in the dedication that knew who Curtis was. All right. You may have heard that there was a prisoner named Dorrance Atwater who because of his beautiful handwriting was asked to clerk at the prison hospital and write the entries in the book of the register of the dead. He wasn't the only clerk that did this, um, but he's the one that not only did he write in the register, but he made an extra copy of it. And when his group of prisoners left in February of 1865, he smuggled his list out because he wanted the families of the soldiers who had died to know what had happened, know their cause of death, know when they died. Um, there is a big stink afterwards because the US government doesn't want that list released. And they get him to come and cop give it to him to copy and they pay him for it, and then they don't give it back even though he wants it back to publish. Um, when they go to set up the National Cemetery, for, um, Clara Barton, the woman who heads the Red Cross, eventually gets involved and she asks for the list to be able to identify the graves properly. They give it to her. Uh, Atwater is down there to assist her with the task, and when they finish setting up the National Cemetery, he takes his list with him. Uh, the federal government responds by arresting him for a theft because they say they paid him for the list and they put him in prison at hard for a year of hard labor. Um, and this is a guy who has just come out of hell. Um, he physically couldn't take it. Clara Barton intercedes, the story becomes well known and the list finally does get published. Unfortunately, Atwater's list um, is destroyed in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. It was in his house in San Francisco. The earthquake came, they needed to make a fire break. They dynamited his house and they dynamited the list with it. So we have some copies of his list. We also have the original page of the death register from Andersonville prison. Unfortunately, as you can see, it's in really rough shape. And this is the page that the Raiders are on. Uh, you can see one line going across, it's kind of dark. And then it lists the Raiders and there's another line. Uh, let's take a look at this up close. Okay, so the Raiders are between those two lines. And the first one says Muir, A, U.S. Navy. Uh, if you look at the name Muir, and remember the name on the grave says Mun, M-U-N-N, -N, you can kind of see how they misread it. And that is actually what I think happened. It was just a mistranscription and the wrong name got put on the gravestone. Uh, Anderson Mill and the National Park Service's policy is that the grave markers at Andersonville are historic relics and cannot be changed in any way. So even though I'm going to prove that some of these guys are somebody else, the Park Service will not change their graves or any others. Okay, so Amun U.S. Navy, that's the first one. The next one, the name looks like it ends with B-A-N, starts with a J. It's a private in the 76 New York. Now, remember, I said the name that was missing from the graves at, at the beginning of this talk was John Sullivan, who was with the 76 New York. Okay, Sullivan's listed on the death register. The next name you really can't see at all. It might end in a D. In fact, it does. Uh, 140th New York, um, it would be John uh, J. Sarsfield. His grave marker says his name was John. His compiled military service record, which does say he was hanged at Andersonville says that his first name was James. So his marker is wrong, but okay, Sarsfield is on the list. 
The next one, what well, first name begins with a W. It is a corporal and it's 88th. That corresponds to William Collins, 88th Pennsylvania, who is the only one who was ever promoted beyond private. Um, okay. Uh, gonna skip the next one for a minute and go down to the one you can actually see. The last of the Raiders' names is Delaney J. It should be a P because his name was Pat Patrick, but you're gonna go with it. Uh, 83rd Pennsylvania. Okay, so now we look at the name above. If the graves and the history is right, that name should be Charles Curtis, 5th Rhode Island Heavy Artillery. You can't really see the name, but that is not a five. That is a U. It matches the U up in U.S. Navy for Andrew, Andrew Muir. And if you look at the rank, it's hard to tell, but I think that says seaman. Charles Curtis of the 5th Rhode Island is not listed in the death register, but an unknown seaman from the U.S. Navy is. And remember, there are two Navy graves markers on the Raiders' graves. Okay, so that was pretty interesting. So next I went and looked at Charles Curtis's medical records. Uh, it's different from his service records, but this is kind of interesting. Um, they're not really in order. So the one in the middle is the first one. It says that Charles Curtis, uh, Fifth Rhode Island Heavy Artillery, he's hospitalized for intermediate fever tertian. Um, he probably has malaria. He gets sick, he gets better, he gets sick, he gets better. He's admitted November 13th, 1863 and stays till December. Okay, no problem. The next one's the one that gets really interesting, the one that's all the way on the right. He's admitted to the hospital on April 14th, 1864. The 5th Rhode Island Heavy Artillery is gonna be captured in May. The entire regiment is captured at Fort Cotton. And if you look at when he gets out of the hospital, he doesn't leave the hospital until August 12th, 1864. He is not with his regiment when his regiment is captured. Um, he, is, he is not with his regiment. He is not in Andersonville when he is supposedly hanged in July of 1864. Um, whoever that was, it was hanged using the name Charles Curtis, was not Charles Curtis of Fifth Rhode Island. Um, I don't know how the person got hold of Curtis's identity and Curtis's name. Um, that's the one piece I can't make match, but it wasn't Charles Curtis. And just to end Curtis's story, um, over on the right in September, big September 2nd, 1864, when he's been dead for two months, supposedly, he is hospitalized again for enlargement of the abdomen. They send the poor guy off on furlough on September 19th. He's due back October 19th. He doesn't come back. You can say I blame him. And they finally declare him as officially having deserted, which he did. Um, in Janu on January 1st, 1865. Um, I have no further information about this gentleman other than he wasn't hanged. All right, so if Charles Curtis wasn't hanged at Andersonville, who was? Um, this is a section from the Sunday Mercury trial transcript and where it says third day proceedings. It first, um, the first person is, who is charged is Richard Allen, 83rd Pennsylvania Company E. The second man is William Rickson, W-R-I-X-O-N, alias Curtis, United States Steamship Powhatan. Now, if you remember, the name of the other sailor besides Munn on the grave is W. Rickson, R-I-C-K-S-O-N. I told you that there's nobody ever named Rick Rickson, R-I-C-K-S-O-N in the Union Navy, nor is there anybody named Rickson, W-R-I-X-O-N in the Union Navy. Um, there is, however, a sailor on the Powhatan who has a name that's really, really close, and that sailor became a prisoner of war. Um, the sailor that I talked about at the beginning who had the diary was a guy named Frederick Augustus James who was caught at the Second Battle of Fort Sumter. Uh, it was a total catastrophe. They thought they'd just go in and take Sumter back after bombarding it for weeks. Um, the Confederates were, were waiting for them. Um, not all of the sailors, it was an amphibious attack. Not all the sailors made land. The hundred who did uh, got creamed. It, the whole battle was over in less than 20 minutes and there were 110 sailors who were taken captured, captive. One of them was Frederick James. Another was a sailor from the US Powhatan named William Ritson. 
R-I-T-S-O-N. Um, I know that Ritson is with them when they go to their first prison at Richland Jail. They then go to Libby. From Libby, there's a group of them that are designated as hostages, 15 of them, and they get moved to Salisbury. They all end up back at Andersonville. Somewhere in there, William Ritson disappears. And the last record I can find on William Ritson is this memo from the Navy Department trying to resolve you know, a bunch of loose ends from the war. And it says his final disposition is not reported. They don't know what happened to him. I think that somewhere along the line, William Ritson assumed the identity Charles Curtis. And if you were gonna commit crimes, you wouldn't want people to know who you really were. So that would be a reason to do it. But like I said, I can't figure out how he came up with that name of an actual person. Um, a little more proof that Ritson is, Ritson is actually um, Curtis. When the deaths are written in the, the hospital, prison hospital register, by the way, the cause of death is, death is asphyxiation. Um, over on the right, they list the squad and the mess number. And that was how they would take role and that was how they would distribute food to the prisoners. There, the squad detachments had 270 and each mess had 90 people. And that was your group for food distribution. Uh, Ritson is in detached uh, squad 69, mess number two. Uh, in his only letter home, Frederick James, who was a also a sailor captured at Second Sumter is in detachment 69, mess number 62. And it says that on the letter on the right. So these two guys arrived at the prison at the same, at, at the same time. Um, Ritson, I believe, was probably one of the hostages at Salisbury. And that was why he and James and the other hostages all arrived on the same day. Uh, there's also a little bit of proof. There's a letter to the National Tribune, which ironically was edited by John McElroy. And it's a prisoner from Tennessee who says that when the execution happened and Curtis ran by, he recognized Curtis because Curtis had been a prisoner in the at Salisbury Prison, third floor of the mill building with him and Frederick James and the other hostages. Um, I was in Andersonville and remember the hanging of the Raiders. I knew Curtis who caused a stampede by running from the big gate to the creek. He was a sergeant of the floor at Salisbury and a member of a gang of deserters from our army. That wasn't quite true, but that might've been the story that he was telling at that point. I did not know the fellow had been sent to Andersonville until the day that they were hung. So I can place Ritson as being a captive. I can place him as having been a sailor. I can place him using the identity of Curtis at Salisbury. And I have an eyewitness here who says that he saw Curtis and recognized him. Uh, so how did Curtis's name not end up in the death register then, but it did on the graves? Well, remember when he ran off, most of the people told the story the next day, oh yeah, that was Curtis, he tried to escape. The one group of people who knew that he was actually a sailor were the other sailors that were captured along with him. Uh, some of them had been living with him every day since September of 1863. Uh, in fact, one of them was the ship's nurse on the Housatonic, a guy named Richard Tinker. And um, Tinker and seven other sailors were working at the prison hospital, according to Frederick Augustus James's diary. Any one of them could have identified him as Ritson. And then they included the name Curtis because everybody knew Curtis because he was the one that ran away. But Sullivan was um, trying really hard to hide his identity, and he was the one that was the least known, so he's the one whose name got dropped, I believe. Uh, one more little bit of evidence, and this is kind of a, a sad, kind of a, a sad story, but an interesting story. When the sailors found out that they were going to be sent back north, you know, in September of eighteen. 64, um, they came up with a plan and their plan was they were gonna rescue as many soldiers as they could okay, by giving them the identity of sailors who had died. And there's actually an account in the 120th New York um, regimental history where a prisoner named William Hale says that he was working in the gang Green Warden. He went to sleep one night and he woke up with a guy shaking him by the shoulder. He said, come on outside. 
they went outside and it was Richard Tinker, the ship's nurse from the Housatonic. And Tinker said, listen, I just got asked to make a list of all the sailors at Andersonville because we're gonna be shipped out of here. Um, my friend, Frederick Augustus James just died within this past week. When we leave here, you're gonna use the name Frederick Augustus James. You were a carpenter's mate on the Housatonic. You're from East Boston. And he told him everything that you could think of about Frederick Augustus James. And they were able to get hail out. They actually got out, I think it was about 57 sail soldiers. Uh, well, 55 and two civilians. But they don't usually talk about citizen prisoners who were there. Anyway, um, so this is the list of returning prison, returning sailors. And the one on the left is you, most of the guys from the Powhatan. Every sailor who was from the Powhatan who was captured at the second battle of Fort Sumter's name is on this list with one exception. And that's William Ritson. I don't know if they thought that he he would be, they would catch it if they put him there and listed his name, that he was too notorious, or if he was just so disdained by the rest of the prisoners, they didn't want to, want to give it, saddle anybody with his identity. But Ritson's name is not on the list of sailors who were exchanged. And on the right is this, a bunch of sailors from the water which and it's not quite as rock solid. There are a couple of water witch guys who aren't listed. They may have been sick and not able to travel or whatever, but one of the names from the got the water witch that is not there is Andrew Muir. So he's not listed either. That's just kind of an interesting fact. Uh, we talked about Dorrance Atwater. When I was going through his file at Andersonville, I found this separate list of the Raiders. And if you will notice down on the bottom, it says, William Rickson, alias Curtis, and for his vessel, it says USS Powhatan. So there you go. All right, spent a lot of time on Curtis. Now we're gonna talk about Mosby. Mosby is the most famous of the Raiders. If only one Raider is mentioned by name in the diary, it's usually Mosby. And he got his nickname because of his style of attack. He's kind of like a prison crime board. Um, he has groups of guys who are committing crimes they live in the southwest corner of the prison, and he's kind of got your back if you're one of his, his gang. Um, he gets his name after the Confederate guerrilla Mosby, who would have a small attack. They'd run in, they'd cause their damage, they'd get out uh, before the enemy could regroup. And that was pretty much how the Raiders operated. You'd have a small group of them, they'd go in, they'd cause their havoc, grab what they needed, run back to the southwest corner, and then they were with friends and there was not much anybody could do about it. So Mosby is, on paper, he's a pretty good soldier. He enlists really early in the war, May 1861. He's assigned to the 88th Pennsylvania. At 2nd Manassas, he is shot in the thigh, he is captured, he is held prisoner, he's paroled three days later, and they send him to the hospital. He goes back to his regiment for 12 days in 1862 and then returns to the hospital again. He goes back to his regiment in late February or early March. He fights at Chancellorsville. He fights at Gettysburg and Gettysburg is where he is promoted to corporal. Uh, he's captured somewhere near Stevensburg on October 12, 1863. And he is famous as the man they had to hang twice. And if you thought Curtis's ending was bad, this is probably worse. Um, Curtis, well, Collins is a big guy. He's about six foot, tall. Uh, three of the Raiders are only five foot three. They're little guys, but his is a big guy for the time. Uh, I've read accounts that say he weighed 200 pounds. Whether that was true in Andersonville or not, I don't know. Um, I think that's actually how he got promoted to corporal. He was just big and loud. His regiment on the first day of Gettysburg was the first, his company was the first ones over the wall going after Iverson's brigade. And I think he was just big and loud and could make himself heard. And that's why they promoted him in a field promotion. Okay, so he looks like a pretty good prisoner there. Sorry, a pretty good soldier there. But uh, there is this letter. And the letter says that um, Private William Collins, 88th Regiment of Pennsylvania Volunteers, was on the list of yesterday to go to his regiment. This is a letter from one of the hospital officials but escaped and went into the city. I saw him on the street today and caused him to be arrested and brought to our guardhouse. He has an old wound of the thigh, which causes him to limp when under inspection. But today I saw him walking as well as any person could. 
He is a hard drinker and has been in our guardhouse before. Can you not take him under charge and send him to his regiment by the first opportunity? We may not have convalescents to send for some time to come, and this man is better off in the field than confined here, where he is a source of annoyance. So not a great soldier. And just because I like maps, you can see he's not cap he's captured within a couple of days and within 30 miles of Patrick Delaney. Um, they probably met on their way to Belle Isle, which was the first prison they were held at. If they didn't meet at Belle Isle, they met in Belle Isle. And the word raider and practice of prisoners stealing from other prisoners is documented as happening at Belle Isle. It may very well have been these guys starting their crime career uh, at a place where nobody's ever heard of them. According to his record, Collins is, a, Collins is a deserter, but I'm not entirely convinced of that. Um, when he goes missing, he's already been over two years with the 88th Pennsylvania. He only has seven months left to serve. He's been through three major battles. He's been wounded. He's been captured. He's been paroled. He's been promoted. The night he goes missing is a new moon. Um, it's dark. They're, they know there are Confederates in the area. His, reg, his company is marching on the double quick, trying to get into position, trying to guess where the Confederates are. And I think that it's possible that he just uh, broke away from his, reg, his company for a couple of minutes, maybe to relieve himself. And when he tried to get back to them, he bumped into the Confederates instead and ended up as a POW at Andersonville in Belle Isle. Um, and as we said, he is the one that is hanged twice. Um, they get him up there. He's a big guy. They, ha they hang them by having them all on a platform. They knock the platform out from under them, and then they drop and hang, except Collins, who's so big, breaks the rope. And the executioners go over. They pull the hood off his, his head. They're very unhappy to find out that he's not dead. Um, they revive him. He looks around and says, is this is the afterlife. They say, no, but hang on, you're going to be there in a minute. And they force him, they said, crying and begging piteously back up on the gallows and they hang him a second time. Not a pleasant way to go. Okay, James Sarsfield, his gravestone says he's John, 140th New York. He is 22 years old when he enlists, 23 when he dies. Little guy, he is five foot three and a half gray eyes, brown hair, an Irish immigrant. He may have come to the US as recently as May of 1863. Um, there is a guy named James Sarsfield, the right age, who's documented as coming in from Ireland in May. He is drafted. Uh, Robert Kellogg, who wrote, had a diary and wrote a pretty good book memoir, said that if it wasn't for the draft, there wouldn't ever have been raiders. And he's kind of right because up until the draft started in 1863, um, the guys who were soldiers wanted to be soldiers. They had signed up, they had volunteered. Once the draft comes, you have guys who don't wanna be there and they don't really care if they follow orders and they don't really care about the, the war. They're just, you know, uh, there because they had to be. Um, and when you get guys like this into the army who don't wanna be there, you're gonna get, the criminals and the lower lives and the deserters and the people who really are not invested in the fight. The quality of soldier goes down with the draft and the number of criminals in the service goes up with the draft. Um, Sarsfield is drafted. He's captured at the Battle of Wilderness. The Wilderness. He is listed as missing in action. At no point does his regiment ever imply that he was a deserter. Um, he's only at Andersonville five weeks when he gets arrested and seven weeks after he arrives, he is hanged. He is not there for very long, relatively speaking. Um, kind of like Patrick Delaney, there is evidence that he was may have been committing crimes on his way to Andersonville. Um, there was somebody else in the 140th who came down about the same time, mid-September mid -September of 1863. And he wrote a letter to his wife saying that he had been um, he had been robbed while on the ship on the way down. And the letter said, he's talking about the money. It was picked out of my pocket when I was asleep. And it was well that I was, for if I had awoke up and catch them at it, I would have pitched into them and got knifed like some of the rest of them. But let it go. Damn them, they got $18 out of me, but they did not get it all. So again, you have them assaulting people in their sleep. Um, 
people are knifed and that's going to come up again in a couple of minutes. And Sarsfield is the one who rather famously made the threat to cut out somebody's heart and shove it down his throat. So very well could have been that Sarsfield was committing crimes on the boat, could even have been on the same ship as Delaney and Sullivan. They all came down to the same area at about the same time from New York. Okay, the missing man. And this guy is a deserter. He is a bounty jumper and he is really hard to pin down. Um, he gives everybody different names. Uh, sometimes he's John, sometimes he's Terrence, sometimes he's Terry, sometimes he's Carrie, sometimes he's Sullivan. Uh, sometimes Carrie is a first name, sometimes it's a last name, sometimes Ter Terry is his last name. Uh, he's trying really hard to obscure his identity. Uh, according to his compiled service record, he is John Sullivan. He enlists as a substitute when he's 26 years old and dies the following year. Another little guy, he's five foot three and a half, blue eyes, dark hair. Says he's an Irish immigrant and there is a suggestion that he, somebody may have known him in Canada. So he may have come by way of Canada. He enlists August 5th, 1863, and he's captured on the night of October 10th to 11th, same year. Um, because of all of the different names he gives, he's hiding his identity. When he first gets there, he's the only one from the 76 New York, but later on in the prison's operation, a group of prisoners from the 76 New York Regiment come and they see him and they recognize him. Um, he has good reason to want to hide his identity aside from the fact that he's a thief. Just before he was captured, there was a guy in his regiment who had deserted. He was a bounty jumper. He enlisted again, ended up getting shipped back to the 76 New York. They recognized him. When Sullivan was captured, the guy was being tried for desertion and eventually they did, they did execute him. So Sullivan really doesn't want people to know who he is. He tells the guys from the 76 New York, if you don't tell people who I am, I'll take care of you and I'll protect you from the raiders. And according to the one memoir that post McElroy that I am going to cite, um, there's a guy named John Morrell Morthrop from 76 New York who knew Sullivan. He says he recognized Sullivan. And he says that at one point, one, a blanket was stolen from one of the guys in the 76. They go to Sullivan, they tell him about it, and they said within a very short time, Sullivan returns the identical blanket to the guy who got robbed. So he's kind of keeping his side of the bargain, but he's also not a real um, respectable guy. Um, that's pretty much all I know about Sullivan. If you look, he's captured really close and the same week as Delaney and Collins. So they may have been a gang long before they ever get to Andersonville. The last guy, Andrew Muir, uh, the one that's known as Amon, he was a seaman on the Water Witch. Um, 22 years old, 23 when he dies, light blue eyes, auburn hair, he's five foot five. And I thought this was kind of interesting. He's missing his eyelashes when he enlists. And when he's executed, several diarists and memoirs made the comment that he didn't have a beard. One guy accused him of shaving the beard off to try and hide his identity, but I don't think that's the case because after they were captured, they were held outside the stockade with no possessions, just the clothes on their back. And I'd, he wouldn't have had access to a razor or shaving material. There is a medical condition called alopecia where the body's immune system attacks the hair follicles. And so hair in different parts of the body will not grow. Um, missing eyelashes and no beard, I kind of think that he may have had alopecia. Because he has no beard, I think that's why some people thought he was younger than he was. Um, there's a, there was the remark about him being a poor Irish lad that Ransom made. There's also a prisoner named Ed Glennon who said it was sad to see a beardless boy up there with all those hardened men. Uh, I think he's talking about Muir. Uh, Muir is a seaman, which means he's been a sailor for at least three years before he's enlisting. He's already served a year on the water, which in fact, this is really sad. His enlistment is up. He is just waiting to go back to, uh, to land so that he can leave the Navy and get on with his life. Unfortunately, the Navy is really short of guys and they keep the guys on the water, which pass their enlistment. While they're there one night in June, um, 
The ship's boarded by Confederates and the water witch is captured along with all the crew. There is a report that the guys whose enlistment was up didn't put up a fight. Um, in fact, some of them were supposedly hiding when the Confederates came. And um, I'm sure that was a decision that they regretted once they got to Andersonville. So he's captured on June 3rd, 1864. He gets to Andersonville, according to Fred James's diary, the whole crew of the Water Witch on, arrives on June 7th. He's arrested as a raider on June 29th and he's executed on July 11th. He is not there very long. Um, three weeks until he gets arrested, five weeks until he's hanged. Um, and the question with Muir is always, what the hell did he do to get in so much trouble so fast? Um, the only thing I can tell you is that it looks like he took part in the attack on the prisoner known as Dow. Um, this is a little section from the trial transcript. According to the testimony of Newton Baldwin of 76 New York, who was in Sullivan's uh, company, uh, saw Muir engaged in robbing Dowd, saw him on top of Dowd trying to cut out his pocket and fumbling in it. The first time he saw Muir engaged in robbing was when he and the others attacked the orderly sergeant, the orderly sergeant beat Dowd. So, it was, may have been his first time robbing anybody at Andersonville, but unfortunately it was such a vicious beating that the four guys that committed the crime, um, Delaney, Sarsfield, Sullivan, and um, Rickson are, the, are tried. Um, you'll hear that the guys that were hanged were actually chiefs of different groups of raiders. No, they were, these four were working together uh, Collins was probably like the prison crime lord and oversaw them. And Curtis, I'm have, whoever Curtis was, or Ritson is, cut some beef with the members of the 16th Illinois Cavalry. And I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but uh, there, if you look at who testifies against Curtis at the trial, all of the guys that testify against him are either members of the 16th Illinois Cavalry or they're sharing a tent with somebody from the 16th Illinois Cavalry. So there's something weird going on there. That's not the case with any of the others. Okay, so I've talked to you about six really despicable people. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about a guy that nobody has ever heard of that I consider a hero. Um, you've heard that Dowd was a prisoner who was beaten so savagely by the Raiders that Henry Wartz took one look at him and said, I want the guys that did this. No one's ever really been able to identify Dowd in part because they spelled his name D-O-W-D. Uh, he's actually John G. Dowd, D-O-U-D, of the 97th New York. And his story is really kind of sad. Um, Dowd is a 41-year-old farmer in Avoca, New York, not married. He lives with his mother. He supports his mother. And then he gets drafted. His mother's 61 years old. Her husband's dead. She goes to the draft board and asks them to not take him because he's her only means of support. The draft board says no. She does have a daughter who's a teacher, but uh, he was her main means of support. Um, so he, before he goes off to war, he goes to the local store, he sets up an account so his mother will be able to provide for herself. He fights at Bristow Station, he fights at Mine Run, he gets captured at the Battle of the Wilderness. When he is captured, he has $140 in cash, he's recently gotten paid, sewn into the waistband of his pants. Um, he really wanted to get that money home to his mother eventually, but he couldn't once he was in the prison. He is approached by, I think it was Sarsfield, who asks him if he wants to buy a watch. And this was one of the things the Raiders would do to kind of scope out who had money in the prison. Um, there was a group of prisoners that came in from Plymouth, North Carolina, and one of their terms of surrender was they would get to keep whatever they had with them, and the Confederates honored that. But they had just gotten paid, they got back pay, they got their enlistment bounties, these guys were flush with cash. And so the crime rate wasn't too terrible at Andersonville before the Plymouth guys came in. Once they got there, it skyrockets. The attacks become more brazen. They start happening in the day instead of in the dark and they become more and more and more vicious until this happens. Um, Dowd is in his tent. He is literally has his pants off. He's trying to brush them off. Um, Sarsfield has come back and he's got Sullivan Delaney and you're with him and he wants the money and um, dad 
puts up a fight. Um, they hit him with brass knuckles. They hit him with fists. They kick him. There's a knife involved. His hand gets slashed. Um, they beat the crap out of him. And then they finally get hold of the pants and they cut it up and get the money. Um, he's so badly beaten that not only does do they say we want the guys that did this, they take Doubt out of the stockade and they give him liberty to go wherever he wants up to a mile. He's so badly beaten, I think, that they don't want to send him back because he is a mess. And he is literally one of the very last prisoners that they let leave Andersonville. When he gets home, he is in horrible shape. Um, he's not able to work as a farmer anymore. He opens up a cooper shop. He's still trying to support himself and his mom. But even that gets to be too much for him and he can't physically work. And he ends up dying on September 3rd, 1869. Uh, just to prove what, I, what I'm saying about Dowd, this is the testimony of one of the uh, other guys from New York who lived in Avoca, who was at Andersonville with Dowd. And he says, on or about the 1st of July, 1864, there was a riot amongst a party of New York rough prisoners, and they attacked this John G. Dowd, and he was badly beaten and robbed of his money and watch. He was much disabled. He was taken outside by Captain Wartz, who thought he was nearly killed, and I never saw him afterwards until I met him in Avoca, Steuben County, New York, July 1865, after his discharge. He was very much disabled and continued so till his decease in 1869. He informed me that his head always troubled him after his beating at Andersonville. So one of the things that I'm most proud of with this book and being able to tell this story is I can say this is the guy who really brought down the Raiders, John Dowd, and he deserves to be remembered. Uh, the question always comes up, did the, were the Raiders actually murderers? And you'll remember that I said I went through the death registers from the time the prison opened until the arrests and found nothing. Um, the, there are six diaries that say that after the prisoners were arrested the next day, they went to the Raiders tents to try and get some of their stolen stuff back. And when some of them couldn't find their stuff, they thought, well, maybe they buried it. So they started digging under the tents, only they didn't find their stuff. They found two decomposing bodies. Um, you do not end up buried under somebody's body unless they killed you and put you there, especially in Andersonville. Um, and really kind of ghoulish to think of it, whoever it was that killed them, and they're not, they never specified which Raiders tent it was, uh, not only killed them and buried them, he then slept on top of the bodies. Um, he couldn't have dragged them out to the prison gate without people seeing it. And so he just hid them. Um, so I went back to the death registry and sure enough, the day after the Raiders are arrested, there are two deaths, no name, no regiment, no cause of death, just the grave number. And when I took the grave number and I went out to uh, the cemetery, at this portion of the cemetery, the graves are all about four inches apart until you get to these two. And they're the two on the left and they are flush up against each other. And I think what happened is that the bodies were so decomposed that they couldn't tell one set of remains from the other. So they buried them both in the same grave and put the stones right up against each other over the same grave. Um, kind of sad. The other thing that's kind of interesting in this picture is the unknown US soldier on the right. Um, when they went to arrest the Raiders, it was kind of a free-for-all, and they took out probably about 50 to 80 guys. There were only about 80 to 120 Raiders in the prison to start with, in spite of what uh, McElroy tells you. Most of the prisoners put the number of Raiders at somewhere between 80 and 120. Um, so they took out a bunch of them. Henry Ward said, I'm not keeping this many guys. Pick out the worst ones, and I'm going to send the rest back into the prison. The other prisoners knew that these guys were gonna be forced back into the prison and they were mad and they wanted vengeance. And so they lined up on either side of the gate with clubs, rocks, whatever they could find, sticks. And the Confederate guards had to force these guys into the prison one at a time. And they had to, it was, they referred to it as running the gauntlet. They had to run between these two rows of guys with clubs and sticks trying to beat you. And the story goes that at least one guy was killed while trying to run it. And that's the guy who's over on the right, I'm pretty sure, just based on the date. Um, he's the only other unknown that day. 
And um, there he is. That's a pretty horrible way to go too. Uh, so that's pretty much my talk. This is a picture that was taken by former park ranger Jennifer Hopkins showing the raiders' graves separated from the other graves. And this was Christmas time, so all of the other ones have graves, have wreaths on them, but theirs don't because they're still not forgiven and they never will be. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, the book, by the way, is Andersonville Raiders by Gary Morgan, who was published by Stackpole Books. It's available as a hardcover or an ebook, and you can buy it through your local independent bookstore, or if you don't have one, online through Barnes & Noble, and Amazon, or Stackpole Books. And if you would like an autographed book plate, you can shoot me an email, and I will stick one in an envelope and send it off to you. Thank you.